सर की कॉल नहीं लग रही है प्रिंसिपल गई all the faculty and staff i welcome you to this rather exciting webinar this is the inaugural webinar of a five part series organized by internal quality assurance cell government college for women ma road we organized a similar series last year in july and the reception and reviews of the series were very positive which prompted a follow up this year you can find those webinars on our youtube channel gcw ma road and do subscribe to the channel considering that it seems unlikely that this pandemic is leaving us anytime soon it is prudent to utilize this time wisely and create opportunities where none seem to exist and exploit the platform of digital learning that people like rahil provide us i will start the program by inviting our principal professor yasmin ashai to welcome the guest formally thank you dr abina <clears throat> am i audible to everybody yes yes ma'am good evening at the outset uh, i would like to extend a very warm welcome to our honorable vice chancellor who probably uh, might join us later professor kayum hussain um, i've sent a link to him so but we'll continue and see if he joins us a very warm warm welcome to our guest speaker mr rahil khurshid well uh, mr rahil on behalf of the college on my own behalf I express my gratitude to you for sparing your time uh, to be with us in this session, despite we understand a very busy schedule. Well, uh, although our guest will be speaking extensively about the theme of media and technology, with particular reference to social media, but I would just like to emphasize the importance of the theme of the session. Uh, going by the sheer number, one can easily gauge the popularity of. Uh, and hence the importance of social media recently our journalism department conducted a workshop in collaboration with google news initiative 
and uh, some of the statistics shared by the resource person were quite revealing presently there are an estimated 400 million social media users in india alone i guess facebook remains the most popular choice followed by others like twitter and instagram of course whatsapp has become an integral part of our lives in 2023 the number of facebook users in india is expected to reach over 444 million up from 281 million in 2018 indicating an exponential growth in the social media user base uh, well with the arrival of the network internet followed by social media it has revolutionized all fields of life there has been a dramatic increase in the risk of misinformation disinformation and propaganda fake news goes viral and spreads faster than authentic information and by the time someone puts out a rebuttal or clarification the damage is already done quite often our educational institutions and even my own college has faced this kind of a problem some miscreants spread the fake news about certain things related to the college and becomes it becomes quite challenging well to tackle this kind of misinformation uh given the importance of social media and online content in contemporary times fact checking has become so important and we've been hosting series of workshops for journalism students other than what dr abina mentioned in collaboration with google news initiative and data leads and the workshops were mostly focused on the tools to monitor online content and train the students in verification strategies to counter the fake news just recently on may 30th we had a workshop with one of the google certified trainers and last year in october also we conducted a similar online workshop on fact checking with another google uh, certified trainer and prior to that in november 18 uh, we hosted an offline workshop on busting fake news all these workshops have been quite productive for the students today of course uh, we have rahil with us who's the right person to talk about technology and give us a broader perspective on the subject we would love to have you uh, rahil at our campus uh, for an offline session and god willing that might happen very soon but uh, for now we can just back you know sit back and uh, relax and listen to your experiences and insights once again thank you very much for accepting our invitation at a very short notice and that too i guess i heard that you are traveling from one uh, continent probably to another and thanks once again i don't want to stand in between you and uh, all my colleagues uh, and student participants so uh, lovely to have you and uh, to listen to you thank you very much thank you very much ma'am now i will read out a brief bio of rahil which is not very brief I try to make it as brief as possible, but considering what all he has achieved at such a young age, it's very difficult to do that. I'm really happy to do this, you know, as I have uh, really had an opportunity to talk about such an accomplished person and what makes the task more pleasurable is that he is the son of the soil, and we're very proud of you. He has inspired a whole generation of students to excel and dominate a world scenario that is based purely on meritocracy. He hails from Anantnag and completed his bachelor's degree there. Then he went on to complete his master's in communication and journalism from Symbiosis Institute of Media and Communication, Pune. He began his career as a journalist with CNN and IBN. In 2009, he returned to Kashmir and joined Times Now, Srinagar Bureau, as an editor. Rahil has joined Mercy Corps to help train young journalists and Amnesty International. well he learned how to do a digital campaign and use twitter for the first time when i read this i was really surprised that you're a trained journalist and yet you are in the technology field so um, he coordinated a petition on change.org against the 2012 delhi gang rape and served uh, as director of communications for india for the organization in january of 2004 it was announced that he would take over as head of news politics and government for twitter india he was the brave child between creation of several technologically related and socially prevalent products including uh, twitter seva that addresses redressal of grievances twitter samvad or yeah samvad i think which is an initiative to bring digital government into the masses and smartfeed a disaster response system 
He has trained participants in the use of technology and social media for affecting social change and has spoken about issues passionately across the subcontinent, including um, at the, uh, in July 2012, second Indo-Pak Social Media Summit in Karachi and the Feb 2013 U.S. State Department Mumbai Tech Camp. He's passionate about intersection of technology and social change and a regular commentator on issues re uh, relevant to news media or national and international outlets like BBC, Time, NDTV, AFP and others. In July of 2018, Rahil resigned from the Twitter India and joined Snap Inc where he was given the title of country expert in India. Nobody, I believe, has been bit, now I believe, nowadays, he has been bitten by the entrepreneurial bug and he is working on a startup called Lamina. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And uh, Rahil believes it can help content creators build platforms and experiences similar to leading OTT platforms such as Netflix and Amazon Prime. He has been honored by several Western educational institutions around the world, and this impressed my daughter a lot. In 2017, he was awarded the Knight uh, Visiting Newman Fellowship by Harvard University, the Yale World uh, Fellows at, uh, sorry, the Yale World Fellows at Yale University. He was listed among Asia Society 2017 class of Asia 21 as a network of young leaders. In 2018, he was a Draper Hill Summer Fellow at Stanford University. I can go on and on about your achievements, but uh, I don't want to stand between you and the participants. So I'm sure uh, if I start talking about you, I will become the resource person for the evening and just go on talking about your achievements. I will uh, let the man do the talking now. And as this pandemic has taught us, you know, to think and rethink, imagine and reimagine, I hand over the virtual microphone to you and please do your thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bina. Thanks, thanks everyone for having me here to the principal uh, for, for saying, the, saying these words. Uh, I really appreciate this platform. Uh, I come from the same system of colleges as, as Dr. Bina said. I did my graduation from uh, Government Degree College Anantanag uh, in uh, you know, science subjects. Um, it's a while ago, uh, but I used to come to the government degree college. Uh, I used to come to your college quite often for debates, uh, say competitions and so on and so forth. So fond memories uh, of, of my association there. Uh, again, really, really wonderful to know that the college has been uh, proactively taking initiatives to uh, keep its student body and faculty abreast of the latest when it comes to uh, technology, including social media technology, uh, and all important and crucial aspects of fighting disinformation and misinformation. Uh, and really thrilled to know that, that, that that's, it's an ongoing thing. And the college has also you know, taken the pandemic as an, used the pandemic as an opportunity, if you will, uh, to double down on conversations like these. Uh, from my point of view, I just like the way I usually structure these things. I'm not a huge, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not big into speeches. How I usually structure these things is that I, I uh, open uh, these uh, these sessions with sort of like five to ten minute overviews, and then I open things up for questions because I feel that's a more uh, authentic way uh, of of communicating. Uh, whatever it is that I want to communicate or like just fundamentally allowing, having people ask questions is a better way of sort of like uh, getting to the point faster. Um, I'll make a few very, very quick points. Uh, the first one is rooted in my own experience of being a student in, in Kashmir, uh, which, uh, you know, can be, a, can be a harrowing experience purely in context of how remote the place is. Thankfully, uh, technology has uh, has shortened some of those distances, but uh, early 2000s, when when I was in, uh, I was a student in Kashmir. I remember I used to initially I wanted to sort of like you know uh, prepare for the civil services before I started to be, before I decided to become a journalist. Uh, and as anyone preparing for civil services would tell you, uh, that you need to subscribe to the Hindu newspaper. Uh, 
So I, I asked my local uh, vendor to you know, deliver a copy for me. Now, uh, this will give you a sense of how remote uh, Kashmir is from everywhere else. So today's Hindu would come to Anantanag where I live the next that evening. Is- uh, by then, you know, the front page and everything else, the city pages and everything else would be relevant. So I'd only read the edit page uh, to, you know, 2014, 15, when I was at Twitter, lazing with news organizations, uh, making sure that uh, whatever it is that they're putting out, they're putting it out in real time on social media platforms, uh, including Twitter. So that folks uh, in remote parts like j are able to access these uh, these sources of information instantly, and they don't have to wait 36 hours for for a, for a morning headline. Um, over the course of my own, uh, you know, interaction, my own journey with with social platforms, with social media technology, uh, things have dramatically, dramatically changed. We've gone from uh, just being able to send chunks of text under 140 characters to now being able to go uh, you know, live on video across platforms. Uh, the distinction and the gap between, uh, between what you could do professionally using an audiovisual setup to now what you can do with your phone uh, has dramatically shrunk. Uh, the four or five years I did as a journalist, for example, uh, I remember I, I, I would be sent to cover stories, and uh, if it was a big story, I would obviously ha- was expected to go live from the spot of that story. Uh, and to do that, I would need to take a camera person, an outdoor broadcasting van, an engineer who operated that outdoor outdoor broadcasting van, and and a couple of other technicians and so on. So it would be an eight people crew in two cars that would go to a spot to report a story live. Now think about that. Uh, and this, then we would set the camera up, we'll connect it to the outdoor broadca- broadcasting van, the van would fire up its dish antenna, it would connect to the satellite, the satellite would then connect to the television station, there would be an uplink, there'd be a downlink, the television the station then would process the signal and then would, would put me on air, right? So the technological barrier for someone like myself, a reporter, to go live in front of an audience was really, really high. It was a lot of money. Now I can just go live anywhere using my 20,000 rupee, 15,000 rupee, 30,000 rupee cell phone. Think about that for a second, like technology that used to cost millions of dollars for you to go live in front of people is now available to you on your cell phone for you to go live from anywhere you want to go live from. So whether that's sort of like a spot of a story, which has given rise to you know citizen journalism, but has also given rise to misinformation uh, or anything else. So within my own sort of like 10 years in tech, I've seen sort of these, these uh, advances dramatically overwhelm and shrink this space. Uh, at the same time, the pace with which uh, education around technology platforms needed to have taken place, uh, that's that's lagged behind. And that's always a case with technology, right? Like it follows Moore's law. Uh, it, it's always advancing way, way, way ahead uh, of everything else. So, you know, as your processor power for your, for your cell phones and your computers and everything else that you use increases, uh, innovation in technology keep space with that and everything else sort of like falls behind. Um, I say these things for for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, for students who I believe is the primary audience of of the session uh, from uh, Kashmir, uh, you're you're often sort of wondering, okay, what is my place in this this modern world as sort of you know, we are all overwhelmed by technology as, as things move really at, at a breakneck pace. Uh, and to you, I say that uh, make sure you are updated and abreast of, of the latest. And not just from a user point of view, not just from the point of view of how to use this, but also from the point of, point of view of what it means for you to be using this. Uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I started to use Twitter as, as a user uh, in, in the newsroom that, that I was in, CNN, IBM, 
fundamentally sort of like looking at this tool to uh, to to share news uh, no one would have anticipated including myself that a few years down the line you know twitter would open an office in india and i'd be the i'd be asked to lead the news vertical um, it was rather you know it was rather funny but also incredibly crucial in pointing out that the skills i had built for a job didn't exist came in handy when the job came up and i i say this that i say i say this from the point of view of you guys thinking about your career in the same way things have changed uh, and things are constantly changing so uh, the the skills that our educational institutions used to impart to us uh, need upgrades and the upgrades are often times on on you to acquire uh, and it's really crucial in that sense that as i said you think about new technologies right like currently as as things stand we are having a moment globally uh, where audio is you know there are a bunch of audio platforms that have suddenly popped last year clubhouse uh, made a made a big splash followed by twitter announcing its own version of uh, social audio spaces called spaces yesterday spotify launched what's called green room facebook is in uh, is experimenting with an audio platform uh, what i want you to think about is what does it mean for you know for our communication as uh, a common sort of chunk of humanity to have gone from text only uh, to video audio photo to photos uh, photos video and live video to now this new emphasis on on voice when voice is the oldest medium uh, the other thing i want you to take away from this is that it can often sort of like if you're on the margins of these spaces it can it can feel like these spaces are really inaccessible and things are set that is not the case that is not the case at all uh of course you know there are issues in context of who has access to technology and that's a very political thing uh and that that relies you know it often reinforces existing power structures uh but i want you to understand that even with with that being true uh there are multiple access points for you to both use the technology and also think through ways in which you can build uh, careers in these in these tech platforms as and i mentioned it outright uh that i come from the same system of colleges and then i went on to work for twitter for snap i now have my own company that uh, you know services clients globally uh and i think it's important for you guys to know that if from the if i can come from the same context that you you can you th that you are from that too you know just like my college was slightly more remote uh you guys there's nothing stopping you guys as well to uh think through this a little little more carefully and and position yourselves slightly ahead uh of where the curve is moving where the technological curve is moving there's a whole host of people from our context itself that have gone on to do really really amazing things uh both entrepreneurial and within the technology service sector uh and i think it's it's really crucial for you guys to think through uh think through these spaces in in that way uh again as i said like in my own lifetime we have gone from uh being able to you know tweet via only text to now this big moment in social audio uh that's an indicator as to how this how this scene is constantly evolving and no one really quite knows you know 5 years ago everyone was sort of uh very big on live video i remember i was at twitter and uh, there was this big emphasis on on live video being a thing twitter acquired this app called periscope which allowed you to go live from anywhere uh, uh facebook did, did did a big push on live video everyone was supposed to sort of like have this have this uh, get behind live video then it turns out people actually don't want to you know broadcast their lives to 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 the rest of humanity and there aren't like many interesting moments that 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 you want to like sort of like whip up your phone uh, and go live on and suddenly last year there was this you know there's a glut of platforms doing social audio and you would think that audio would be the first first entity 
to get its own social platform because voice in that sense is one of the most you know it's the mo uh, earliest medium of communication uh, and everyone has it and it's uh, it's education agnostic if you will it's it's technology agnostic uh, but it's only now in the year of the law 2021 that we've now seen four platforms suddenly at like a billion billion and a half dollar valuation uh, pop in pop in into the universe as contenders for for social platforms in the audio space these platforms also will require people right to service them these platforms so uh, clubhouse for example is going to set up like an india office very soon 6 months 9 months who are the people who are going to be working at this platform are these people uh, you know folks who who are at the intersection of audio and tech are these folks who are who come from social sciences or are these folks who are just very very passionate about technology have no context to uh, you know hard sciences as, as things stand uh, but know how to create content understand what what content works on these platforms have a pulse uh, have a ha have their hands on the pulse of like what the larger audience wants and will these people then be able to uh, get into these platforms and work for these platforms or like create meaningful content because there's a whole host of contexts now where platforms are paying people to create content so that's a question that i want you to sort of like reflect on like what does your own engagement with these platforms mean uh the other crucial thing i think is increasingly what has happened is uh particularly like photo and 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 image sharing platforms have over emphasized on the curation of our lives in a way that might 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 not necessarily be true so it was either going on a vacation or eating really amazing food or doing like or or on a wonderful adventure right and you would often sort of like scroll this feed and you're like what am i doing with my life uh how come like i don't have anything you know curated to share and that is often times incorrect that that impression uh what's really important for you to understand again no the modalities on which the internet of early 2000s was built and the internet of you know 2020s is operating upon the the context of privacy the context of mental health all of these have changed you know 20 years ago no one thought anything of sharing where they lived what they did where they you know where they went on a daily basis they were actually i don't know if you guys remember square it was a platform that uh, allowed you to sort of check in to places thereby leaving a very uh, you know if you will leaving a trail of your location everywhere in the world like everywhere you went in the day uh, and that's a you know arguably a bit of a print in the day uh, and that's a you know arguably a bit of a privacy nightmare particularly for for women for example uh, even though these platforms are voluntary but often times we don't really we don't quite understand what sharing information on these platforms means uh that these you know the the posts that we share on them whether they'll stay on these platforms for perpetuity whether you share something innocuous as a 17 18 19 20 year old uh where your opinions about things are you know still forming you're not as articulate about issues and then 5 years down the line you are sitting for a job interview and someone googles you and you know this post pops up uh and you're asked to explain why did you say thing x about issue y uh so which is to say that uh you know one of the things that 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 you want to be taking away from this uh session is really rethink how you use technology and what purpose you use it for and what trails you're leaving behind on the internet while you're sort of like at a really really crucial stage of your careers and i say this to uh, the, the 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 faculty here as well because i feel like they uh, they are the sort of like they're the ones who who are who are who hold the mirrors who are examples to follow that it's really crucial for for all of us to be cognizant of how we how we use these technologies and what these technologies uh, do to do to our privacy our mental health and our general well-being uh, as i was saying the 20, the 2000 uh, the early 2000s internet was built on on this presumption that the internet is a safe open space uh in 2022 it's 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 turned out that it's not as safe and not as open 
uh, that people can come after you for for you know posting tweets, for posting Facebook messages, and so on and so forth. That you can be cancelled for opinions and so on and so forth. Uh, in that context, it's really crucial for you to you to make sure that you know your hygiene, your internet hygiene, is uh, is taken care of. So make sure you're updated in context to uh, the latest when it comes to what permissions you're sharing with what apps uh, and what is it that you're putting out on the internet for yourself what is the impression that you're putting putting out on uh, for, for the world to see uh, the last thing i want to say is that there is this concerted sort of like conversation around you know the, the fear of missing out as i said everyone is doing amazing things and you feel like you're not that is not correct like that you need to know that everyone is sort of you know struggling in so many ways and uh, no matter like what the, what impression people have uh, or create uh, of of their like online personas it's really crucial for you guys <coughs> to make sure that that things are balanced that you are getting time offline that uh, that you are you know curating your most meaningful relationships not mediated by technology not mediated by technology only of course like it's a great asset when it comes to staying in touch with friends and loved ones uh, and the other thing is that you know again as i said like i uh, when when i was at the stage where you guys are at i used to get a newspaper 36 hours later i really at that point in time didn't know that i could say for example do my masters i went to do my masters in pune not knowing, actually not knowing that I could do a master's in journalism from a, a really prestigious university in the United States, like Columbia or Berkeley, uh, because it was just like that option in my head, like, you know, uh, coming from where I came from, I just didn't, like, there was no direct bridge between where I, where I came from to where I wanted to go. Uh, it was only many, many years later that I finally, you know, wound up in these universities and I realized, oh, like, you know, people here are exactly like me. And I could have done this earlier. And it is with this amazing sort of, uh, you know, you know, it, it's with a lot of pleasure that like I, I see a lot of folks now uh, explore these avenues, uh, reach out to me. I have like, you know, constantly folks reaching out to me saying, so you know we want to we want to we also want to apply to these institutions can you help and uh, i help wherever i can but there is also a whole host of resources available there is just this incredible sort of like internet in that sense is this incredible incredible resource where you can reach out to anyone you you want to reach out to just you know as long as you're mindful as long as you're polite more often than not people will respond to you uh I think I'm going to stop there and open this up for up for questions. Uh, but yeah, and I wanted to sort of like keep, keep this loose and informal if, if that, that that's okay. Yeah, I think thank you so much, Rahul. It was very informative, especially about the privacy, which we are very worried about. Even with young children, we worry a lot yeah. about the privacy. And even our own. I remember the other day I read somewhere that, you know, the mom she calls her daughter for dinner and she says, like, give me 15 minutes. And the mom says, don't uh, wait that long. Your food won't look that good on Instagram after that. <laughs> so that's what you said, you know, everything is out there. And uh, I think uh, we'll just lay out a few ground rules. I think the students should either chat. Yeah, I think uh, uh, yeah. I'll hand over the proceedings to Professor Sohail. He'll take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Rahil, for a very informative session and you have contextualized many important things for us. Uh, on a personal note, I first met Rahil in 2004, 2005, uh, when, I, when I was studying uh, at journalism department of Kashmir University. Uh, and uh, I was traveling to Pune with my uh, batchmates for a month long TV production workshop. And one of his cousins, Janisar, happens to be uh, my batchmate. So Rahil himself was at Symbiosis Pune at that time. Uh, anyways, before we open the floor for questions, I, I'll take this liberty to pose the first one to sort of set the ball rolling. Uh, from a journalistic perspective, we know that social media is very important to reporting as well as promotional tool. Uh, the first part of my question is whether you also see any specific drawback when it comes to journalism. 
Uh, and the second part of the question is, uh, I have observed that while journalists are usually very careful with their news stories, they often land in trouble due to their posts and tweets. So would like to hear about some tips in this regard. Thank you. Uh, yeah, look, like journalism and social media has, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated relationship in, in that, that uh, for, for many a journalist, it's come as, uh, as an avenue for building their own, own audiences. Uh, but in, in many other contexts, it has also rendered uh, the old business models uh, that, that, you know, that, that provided for news irrelevant, uh, thereby sort of like taking away crucial revenue from uh, news outlets. Um, my having spent time on, on sort of like on both sides of, of this debate, first as a journalist and then as a technologist that uh, uh, that worked with news news outlets and journalists. Um, I think it's really crucial that for those of us who are into journalism, that we understand technology really, really well. That we also, but we also understand business models linked to journalism really, really well. Uh, Fifteen years ago, if you were a reporter, you would write a story, and that would be the end of your interaction with the story. It didn't matter to you how the story, uh, how your audience read the story, right? Like you will hand over your story to the desk, they will edit it and an editor would like allocate space to it. Next day, it will find itself in the newspaper and people would read it. And this was sort of like the established norm for a good 40, 50 years. Uh, things have changed now. Like in my, during my own sort of time as a journalist, I remember uh, the stories that I would do, for example, what would find find their way into into the formal channels, and then my own social feeds. What I could put on them. Uh, certainly, I could build more context. I could provide more information. Uh, I could also break news with like you know, with the timestamp, because if say for example I say something uh, that if I break a story. Uh, on my social media feed, there is proof of when that story was broken. That I feel is a is a is a crucial crucial thing for journalists, even though it shouldn't be. Uh, so in that context, it's an it's an incredibly complex ongoing relationship, and you see this in you see this play out in real time in more evolved news contexts like the United States, where you know Google, Facebook, Twitter, and a whole host of other entities are constantly drawing and redrawing their engagement plans with news publishers. Um, and you see this in context of slightly, you know, lesser evolved media markets like, like India, which doesn't have the equivalent of say uh, a New York Times. And I mean that from the point of view of just a, you know, subscriber base uh, or a subscription model. Um, so in that context, it's a constantly evolving relationship. And I do feel that it has come, uh, there's both advantages and disadvantages to it. The advantages are, are that you have access to journalists, you can correct journalists in, in real time if you need to correct journalists in real time. Uh, the disadvantages are obviously that with the proliferation of multiple platforms, uh, that has led to the dilution of a single source of truth. Everyone now goes to their own source of news. And facts have kind of like ceased to cease to matter. So we are, we truly are in that sense uh, in, a, in a post fact world, uh, which technology unfortunately has only aggravated. And with, with public sphere being, you know, polluted by, as as the principal ma'am said initially, misinformation and disinformation, it becomes harder to, it becomes really hard to sort of like put out put out facts that are unvarnished and that are unchallenged because people people will often sort of uh, believe what they want to believe and then find, you know, earlier what used to happen is, and I don't want to sort of like romanticize uh, uh, this, the earlier uh, as often as, as it is romanticized, uh, but you would have, you know, you would basically get to a point of view via uh, a journey of facts, right? Like via inquiry. Now you basically get to a point of view and find evidence uh, littered around the internet to support your theory. So it doesn't really matter whether your theory is correct or not. Uh, 
what matters is what you what you think and the internet is in that sense only aggravated that uh which is why like uh the workshops that you guys are doing uh giving people the, the giving students the tools to equipping them with tools to verify news for themselves verify facts for themselves those become all the more crucial because quite honestly like my one takeaway from about 14 years in this space uh has been that we need to be start doing this at literally like the primary school level like kids in schools should be taught how to verify and cross verify information on the internet uh and they should grow up with those sensibilities and those tools from the from the very outset uh it shouldn't be an afterthought uh, because there is really like no single source of truth uh and and and, and it becomes all the more imperative on us to uh educate our children as to how to operate in a world with constantly shifting uh and moving landscapes what was your second question so you're on mute yeah the second part of my question was uh, that you know the journalists often find themselves in trouble uh, oh, they yeah, are very yeah. safe, you know when it comes to news stories but uh, as soon as they post or maybe tweet yeah. uh, i remember last time uh, shekhar gupta had tweeted something last year and that tweet uh, you know surfaced again this year so uh, that's yeah. it look i again i think it's really for all of us and i don't this is not this is not just true for journalists i think the fundamental rule of thumb is do not tweet anything that you would not want to see in a headline on a newspaper uh it's as simple as that so uh, what does that mean that goes back to the very sort of foundations of hygiene that we that we want to maintain on these platforms and i may, made this point earlier as well to the students that you are you know you are you are you are literally at the at the doorstep of your careers uh and a lot of the lot of the stuff that you put out on the internet is archived it's there for perpetuity uh even if you might delete it like for for my own self for example i had tweeted things as a journalist way back in 2011 12 and then when i started work at twitter a lot of people found like old tweets and started saying that oh he's anti this and he's anti that and he's he's anti whatever uh, thereby sort of like starting these campaigns and a lot of people have actually like i was lucky that it didn't affect my work uh, but a lot of people have lost jobs spaces what they said 5 years ago spaces what they said 6 years ago right uh, which is to say that the internet remembers everything and uh, it's really incumbent on all of us it's an unfortunate thing really uh, because it has also sort of like uh, the space itself is become politicized uh, and there is almost sort of uh, this mob mentality that takes over and i have i'll say this for myself i have fallen victim to it as well right like on both sides with with my tweets tweets being twisted out of context and and then uh, those those things presented as as just like independent uh uh pieces of evidence to establish point a or point b and i have often also you you know in my earlier days you know gone after people how can you say this and blah 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 uh so again like not just for journalists for all of us i think like the thumb rule is to not post anything on the internet that you do not want to uh, want seen blown up as a headline this is a this is a very very hungry beast it works from outrage cycle to outrage cycle uh but whatever the length of that outrage cycle is 6 hours you know 12 hours 18 hours uh know that like anything you say can be taken out of proportion can be you know taken out of context and blown out of proportion uh and it is a very distressing experience for everyone so uh make sure that you are you know uh Uh, again like going back to the point of privacy right like use platforms use avenues that where you're only communicating with your uh, if if there are opinions that you feel like you will get rashed for make sure you are communicating in close groups uh yeah i hope that answers your question yeah uh Thank dr suhail do i get a chance before my students yeah absolutely ma'am absolutely because i'm i'm a, i'm a senior citizen 
So you have to come to respect that. See, I was also like when uh, Raheel talks about, you know, uh, when you like uh, the kind of posts you share or, you know, any kind of tweet. I was also trying to look at the beauty of technology because suddenly after three years, four years, your, uh, you know, tweet or your post pops up or like suddenly you see it surfaces what you've written seven, six years back, as he talked about, probably maybe as a student. I, I, I understand his uh, context when he says that, you know, if you post anything entire and when you go for an interview later, but then look at the beauty. If as a student, you posted something, not a controversial thing. And after seven, 10 years, like, you know, that uh, uh, your post surfaces and then you're asked uh, about what you posted that day. So, I mean, if like, I, I, I understand, yes, we know that we live in a democratic setup where the beauty should be seen as your behavior manifestation at that age. What was your perception? And how did you perceive a certain thing? And after probably you've grown up maybe seven, eight, 10 years and you join a profession, how do you view that? I mean, what is your uh, perception or what is your perspective on that? Don't we see like, don't we also realize the beauty of the technology? It's like, you know, I want to look at my old pictures and I have to take my old album and then I see, look at it, how thin I was, how pretty I was. But then here, I don't, I mean, I don't have to take my album. I don't look at my coffee table. I, it suddenly surfaces. Uh, today I was looking at my Facebook and I saw uh, some, I don't know, five years back, some post has surfaced, which I, with my, with my picture, of course, and people have started commenting, oh, very smart and this. So I wanted to tell them, no, this is five years back. I'm a very fat woman right now. So probably we also should look at the beauty. I mean, this is for my students. Of course, yes, don't, uh, I mean, post anything very controversial or uh, against your, against establishments or against anti-state or whatever. But then if you have a, if you have a viewpoint, a very valid viewpoint, a very valid perception about something, a very nice perspective, or, you know, at a certain age, you start viewing, viewing the world differently because your perceptions are colored probably by the experiences of your parents. They have taught you to view the world uh, with a colored prism. And probably when you grow up, you start viewing the world on your own. So you can also have your own perception and you can also justify and say that, you know, this is when I was 19 and this is now uh, probably when I'm 25. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's, it's important for us to like keep the positive aspects of, of this in mind as well. And uh, as I was saying like earlier that the world has truly in that sense opened up and, and shrunk. Uh, and it is incumbent on us to find ways of engaging with, with tech in a way that's meaningful to us, that's meaningful to our communities. Uh, and that's just sort of like in a, in a way, like, you know, make sure that the discourse that is being created, we are adding to it constructively rather than, rather than negatively. So your, your point is very well taken, ma'am. And we are all uh, senior citizens because of the pandemic. I've, I've aged five years in the last one year. <laughs> Can I add something here? Of course. Of course, what, what ma'am said, it makes sense. You know, it, uh, internet traces or social media traces are how we evolve as people. That's really good. But sometimes I worry and wonder, uh, shouldn't there be some so sort of uh, education for young children on internet etiquette, I can say, or, you know, safety? I think you people should work on that because uh, young children are very impressionable. Yeah, totally. They get carried uh, away. They don't know where to stop. Huh? Yeah, no, I, I mean, there should be something that educates young children, maybe in school or maybe later, or they should create some tools. Something yeah, no, like that. Yeah, 100%. As I said, like one of my key takeaways from working in this space is that, that, that young children should be uh, that internet uh, and the way it impacts people's lives and, and what it does for, for them uh, and to them and to their physical well-being, mental health, mental well-being, yes, mental well-being, it, it should all be incorporated at, at a very, very early, uh, early stage. Young itself. age, yes. We've had like a year, year and a half in Kashmir, two and a half years of kids not being in schools now. Uh, and what does that mean? Like, you know, my nephew who is seven and a half, another one who's four and a half, like they've had to, they've had to basically uh, use the same tools that I use for work exactly. for education 
taken out of their context where they are, you know, like schools and classes where they learn like really crucial interactive skills with each other. In that sense, you know, the importance of schools is they forget, yeah, they've forgotten to socialize. I think exactly right. Like it's mm-hmm. also just cues that you pick up from other kids and this this cognitive sort of like. Uh, expedited cognitive learning that that you experience because of that so all, with all of those things gone and into childhood having, childhoods are very different now they're not the same exactly, as they used to be exactly like i as i said like my uh, the relationship that my nephews have with technology is completely different than my <laughs> own relationship with it yes. like i have uh, one of them is on like snapchat and thankfully it's a, you know it's a private medium in that sense like it's not it doesn't uh, It's it doesn't prompt you to. It doesn't prompt you to post publicly, uh, and it doesn't reward that behavior of like public posting. Mm-hmm. So thereby, you sort of like posting more and more like uh, more and more things that lead to engagement, right? So, uh, and it's an it's an entirely different like for them. It's uh, I remember when my nephew was five, he uh, I'd call whenever I was traveling. I'd call if it wasn't a video call, he wouldn't understand what to do. Because their primary relationship with uh, with the with the, with the with the phone is that of like you know the visual medium. Which one? So it would be really hard for me to like get get him to say something because he just it does in his head it didn't work. You know where is exactly. the voice? Where yes. is the voice coming from? Unless I see the face. Uh, so I think it's really crucial again for us to to. Uh, it's incumbent on us obviously you know and and folks like yourselves yes to, we have a responsibility uh, don't we yeah All absolutely and, and to make sure this is this is woven into the curriculum itself exactly and that's what i meant that's what i was getting at absolutely so hilsa right is there yeah. a chance to students now i think uh, yes yes we want to ask here. something then we can move to students yeah uh, yeah uh, rashid sir you have a question rashid assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam I can you hear me? Can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh this is a kind of a question. This is a two part question and is connected uh, with the academic ecosystem that we have prevalent in the state. You know, when I look at your profile, uh it seems you have moved uh you know drastically from one domain to a tech domain. So uh, somebody it's puzzling to see what's Rahil doing in the tech world because you are helping tech companies to you know uh, you know uh, to uh, to start up kind of kickstart and you are helping them to incubate and you are even you know starting a new a new or tech firms now a uh, uh, two part question in the sense that one is is the uh, you know uh, uh, are there no barriers now because the the disciplines that we are opting for are more interdisciplinary so there's no you know uh, you know uh, underpinning that uh, if i i have studied social sciences i need to pursue certain a career path if i am studying technology or i am studying you know sciences i need to pursue certain a certain career path i think that's that's what's deeply embedded in our students see if i am studying psychology i cannot go into you know say media i am studying uh, you know computer sciences i cannot go into something else is that something that's uh, internationally changing drastically and because the disciplines are more interdisciplinary that obviously as you said that has to be interwoven into our curriculum and pedagogy to make sure that our students you know uh, unleash beautifully absolutely i mean i'll say this my own experience of you know building a building a career uh, building a diverse career uh has been uh, really rewarding but also quite terrifying uh i remember like when i went went into journalism like no one from my family was into journalism before i i did it so my parents didn't really understand it right like we still live in a, a fairly remote and accessible part of the world relative to say you know kids say for example in new york where they have access and opportunity or san francisco where they have access and opportunity to the latest uh, evolving trends so to speak uh, i remember like being uh, when i decided to become a journalist my father was very nervous not not quite understanding what i wanted to do because he was assessing my choices using his frameworks mm. frameworks that he had grown up with right uh and few years later when i decided to quit journalism he again didn't understand he was like why would you you know you have such a great job uh why would you quit it and i was like well i don't want to do it anymore he's like what the hell does that mean i mean i have had the same job for 35 years 30 years 
I haven't quit it. How can you quit a job in five years? And I'd quit not knowing what I wanted to do, which is, you know, which is really al alarming for a parent that their adult child, child is unemployed. Uh, but thankfully, like things worked out. And uh, to your point as to whether we now operate in, in a universe where there are no barriers, I think as long as you yourself are open to learning Thank new you. skills uh, and navigating change, uh, it becomes a lot easier. Uh, there is obviously, uh, you know, something to be said about uh, a whole host of careers, for example, uh, being the way they are. Like if you study all your life to become a doctor, uh, you will in all likelihood, you know, wind up becoming a doctor. Uh, 10, 12 odd years later, you want to make a change and do something else entirely altogether. You can, of course you can. Uh, but I think it's, it's crucial to understand that uh, at the core of it is, is your ability to take, take risk and navigate that risk. Uh, and that's something that oftentimes is not, that's not what we are, what we are taught in schools and colleges. We are often taught risk averse behavior. We are often taught, taught to like take paths that lead to steady employment, uh, which is, it has its own merits. But uh, if you, if you go to look for a, a career path, that's, that's slightly unconventional, I would say that you need to brace yourself for, uh, uh, you know, and you need to have an appetite for risk. You need to brace yourself for, for doing this, doing this all by yourself till till you've gotten somewhere and people see the point of it. Uh, so, again, like now more than ever, you know, thirty years ago or twenty years ago when uh, I was out of college, things were still sort of like linear. Uh, you you did what you chose to do uh, do in college. Uh, now there is a lot more flexibility still, and as long as you are open to new experiences, as long as you are open to more crucially learning and uh, upgrading your skills constantly, uh, and not being like I quit my job at Twitter, which was a you know really great, really well paying international job in 2018. Uh, which at that point in time, you know, a lot of people were like, why, why are you doing this? Like, why are you quitting what is an insanely good job? And I was like, well, I need, I want to try like entrepreneurship, uh, which is completely, again, you know, uncertain. You don't know whether what your idea, whether that'll take off or not, whether you will get funded or not, whether you will find the right people to build the tools that you want to build or not. But you can only find out like if you have some amount of like, in my case, that was the, that was what was great because I had sort of like, you know, cultivated a bit of a cushion for myself financially. So I told myself, okay, I have this, like, you know, I have this pedigree now. I have, uh, I have some money. Uh, so if I don't work for, if no money comes in the next few years, two to three years, uh, I would have, and this idea fails, I would still be okay. I can like walk my way back into a job in the technology sector. Uh, and I would have only learned things. But a lot of people felt, felt that that was an incredibly foolish decision. That why would you, you know, quit an incredibly well-paying international job at a at one of the best tech firms in the world? Uh, but you do that because you want to sort of like explore an idea and you want to learn along the way. And am I, you know, grateful I did that? Yes. Was it terrifying? Absolutely. Uh, but will I do it again? Yes. Uh, but again, it's it's all sort of like it boils down to your own appetite of uh, navigating risk. Thank you. That answers the question. Doctor, yeah. Can I? Uh, so I have two questions in yes. the chat box. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. My name is uh, Monis bin Muzaffar Khan. I am a fourth semester student pursuing my bachelor's in Government College for Women MA Road. Sir, I'll be blunt about it. I'm completely against social media. So here's my question as you have worked in Twitter. Why social media? Uh, as a journalist, uh, why social media? And secondly, we all know that social media is designed. I don't know. We all know. I cannot say that. That I know. This is my perception and all I have done, all the reading I have done, it's according to that. Social media is designed to create a certain type of perspective, to create a certain type of, type of perspective in a person. That and, and, with, and on top of that, 
the data they collect is used for by used for and by multiple organizations for good or for harm, whatever they can do it with. Why living in this tech age, journalists who can do good by going obviously using no, the normal means and going by what they used to instead of social media? Why is social media being hyped so much when it's not doing as good? as it should be doing. Yeah, so I'll get to your question. There are two questions in the chat box. Uh, I think they came first. So one is the situation of fear has been created here, which directly or indirectly discourages journalism students and budding journalists. I don't know if there's a question or a comment, but again, like uh, a lot of like, I come from this context myself, a lot of my colleagues uh, are, are doing what they're doing. And, you know, journalism inherently comes with risk uh, as, a, as a profession. Uh, it is rooted, the ethic of journalism is rooted in <clears throat> your ability to speak truth to power uh, and be that a con conflict context or a non-conflict context that always has consequences. Uh, and folks who know that these consequences exist, that these consequences uh, uh, are, are part and parcel of what you're trying to do. Uh, again, as I said, it goes back to the earlier point of like, what is your, what is your ability to, to navigate risk? Because this is not, you know, uh, if you were to, if you were to take the element of risk away from journalism, it then becomes PR, uh, which is which is not journalism. So anyone who goes into this should go into this consciously, knowing that there are a whole host of uh, issues that you will you will face, uh, and and that you need to prepare yourself for those. Uh, this next question I have is uh, if we'll talk about women and girls, those who have less mobility or issues related to those to find economic opportunities because of low mobility, what type of options and scope they have through social media to earn money and become economically independent. I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer this question in, in like as sharply as you would want an answer for this. Uh, but as I said, again, like there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of jobs uh, that uh, are now particularly because of the pandemic, there's been a, there's been a bit of a shift to remote work. Uh, uh, that have now popped up for for you guys to sharpen your skills and 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 earn money, again like uh, not not uh, into career advice so to speak. And then the last question that I had was uh, why why social media when it's overhyped? Uh, I'm not sure what the right question answer to that question is, or if it's even the right question to ask in this context. Uh, it is it's it is literally like asking you know 400 years ago why the written word. Uh, technological adv advances, you know, they they come, uh, and it's incumbent on us to either accept them or uh, reject them. Now, if everyone around you is accepting them, there's, there becomes an ecosystem where that ecosystem itself becomes the default. And in our case, that's that's where we are at, right? Uh, I mentioned earlier that the relationship to uh, the relationship between journalists and and uh, technology is that of a complicated one. Uh, while it has it has led to the creation of an of an ecosystem where a lot more people uh, can do journalism independently of without being attached to like large news organizations, thereby challenging existing power structures. It has also led to the creation of sort of like this economy of, of fake news and mis misinformation. So uh, my advice, again, from my own experience uh, to journalists uh, who are, are at whatever stage of their careers <clears throat> is that storytelling, which is fundamentally what journalism is, has evolved to incorporate new tools and new platforms. Uh, and it's incumbent on you to uh, learn these new techniques of storytelling. Uh, you can obviously, you know, say no to social media platforms and, and what have you, uh, and do it the old school way, like write long form pieces. Uh, but again, in that context also, your audience, unfortunately, or fortunately is, is on social platforms. So you need to find a way of like getting your work to those. Uh, a lot of my friends, for example, uh, 
you know, they are researchers, hardcore researchers, they write books, they are months, they take months off from social media to write, write stuff. So that is possible. Uh, I just say like, you know, pick and choose your own, uh, uh, own opportunities. Uh, Nella, but what is the point of living, working in a democratic country? Where Ali has is a question. Living? Ali, can you mute, unmute yourself? Is it there? Uh, so you can answer the other question too. Yeah. Yeah. So Nella has a question. Uh, what is the point of living, working in a democratic country where even journalists are supposed to think many times before tweeting, speaking about their perspective? But Nella, the uh, uh, democracy is a constantly evolving uh, space, uh, and uh, and the challenges that journalism journalism students face now uh, are are obviously linked and driven to where their audiences are and 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 where they reach reach out to their audiences, right? But this is a constantly uh, only the only the playground, so to speak, changes. Everything else remains the same. So uh, yeah, contextually, like in in an ideal case scenario, this you know you should be in a position where you are saying what you want to say and where you are uh, there. There are no consequences for that, uh, but there are no ideal case scenarios, and everyone sort of like figures out ways of 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 uh, navigating the spaces that that we occupy in the best possible way that we can occupy them. Uh, as I said, like ideal case scenario would be uh, no consequences for, for what you're thinking, what you are, what you're tweeting. Uh, but in the absence of that, uh, what is the what is the next best thing that you can do is is for all of us to uh, all of us to you know arrive upon that conclusion by ourselves. And as I said earlier, that journalism is inherently a space that uh, uh, that comes with an element of risk, right? Like it's not accountancy. It's not, you know, being an architect where what you are doing, you are asking for uh, your, by virtue of you, your work, you are challenging notions of power, you are challenging power structures, which automatically means you're claiming a share of that power. And that, that comes at cost. Uh, and cost depends on, you know, society. Shut that off it comes. The cost depends on like society to society, and this is the society that that we live in, and this is this is the associated cost of living in that society, uh, and that's fundamentally where things are at. Does social media improve or hurt our society? Uh, in Shasks, I think both, uh, as as Ma'am pointed out earlier, and everyone else has has pointed out fairly articulately. Uh, that it's a two-edged sword. It can, uh, you know, it can put information in your hands, uh, but it can also put misinformation on your hands. Uh, and it's a, it's a constantly evolving landscape. Uh, the growth of fake journalists, Yasser is asking, uh, is rapidly increasing in social media. Don't uh, doesn't this unbreach uh, breach of ethics and sell the whole media? Please speak on this. Uh, fake news is an issue everywhere. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just as a continental thing. Um, obviously there is uh, uh, that it, it's it's a challenge in that that like there are no easy answers to this uh, because oftentimes you realize that a lot of people who hold on to fake information don't hold on to it uh, because sometimes they hold on to it knowing that it's fake information but it fits their belief system so there are again like no easy answers to this it is uh, it is an incredibly com complex, complicated landscape, uh, and and we have to navigate this on a daily basis as it changes. And that's a part of sort of part and parcel of uh, being part of this landscape. Uh, hello, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ali Sadik. I'm a student of uh, Government uh, College for Women, and I'm a student of Bachelor of Journalism and MassCom. Uh, my question was, sir, uh, you spoke about the cancel culture. Very briefly, you spoke about the cancel culture. My question was that uh, nowadays, as you say, it has become really easy for uh, hordes of people, masses of people to get information at the tip, uh, at their fingertips. So what that uh, the issue that creates is that whenever any controversy is uh, created with regards in any specific person instead of uh, people who uh, should you know 
they should form their own opinions their own opinions are silenced by the popular opinions of the uh, mass uh, population and it this happens a lot with a lot of celebrities we have seen uh, like for example it happened to kevin spacey a few years back when uh, one of his old uh, allegations came to light about he having done some sort of abuse with a teenager and what happens is basically that uh, people silence their own opinions because of popular opinion and that can turn out to be very unfair to the specific person involved so my question is how do we equip ourselves to uh, form our own opinions even when we have so many uh, popular opinions around us that may or may not be true yeah that's a really good question ali i think it's it's something that uh, you know all of us uh, struggle with on a daily basis so you're not alone in that uh, uh how does yeah how does one sort of like get to the you know the, your question fundamentally is how does one one get to the the gist of the matter how does one one form, form their own opinions in the context of so much noise exactly uh, and it really goes back to the very core of like what tools we use to assess information uh one and what are the sources uh, of our information uh and that unfortunately you know as i as i said earlier that that we don't have a single source of truth so it is really incumbent on us to uh, verify and cross verify and uh, and come to our own own conclusions in in uh, context to various issues or non issues depending on how you are engaging uh, what you are engaging with and really like what we want to engage with and how we want to engage with is uh, is is our own prerogative right like uh, often times you know you there is this insane pressure for you to be expressive for you to sort of like have an opinion even on things and my point there is that you know you like really don't need to have an opinion have an opinion on everything uh there is it it takes a yeah so i don't know if there's a there's a direct answer to your question but yeah, yeah what i want to tell you that that's it's it's not something that you're feeling in isolation yesterday uh, two days ago i think uh, the nigerian american writer uh, jimanda uh, adiche wrote a really solid essay uh, on this uh, please look it up it's uh, one of the best things i've read on cancel culture uh, and it it might give you you know it it might give you a framework to to use uh yes sir and uh, my other point was that when uh, in a public court of opinion a mat- the verdict of a certain matter has already been put forward even law takes time to take its course because even court judgments are affected by public opinion and the what what we can call the wave which happened with the uh, ayodhya uh, land case ayodhya temple case the public opinion was so strong and that if we look at the matter and and if we observe it keenly we can see that due to the public opinion also a co judgment of the supreme court can also get affected and technology has a huge role to play in that so how do we uh, navigate issues like that where even one lone voice cannot be heard in so much noise like you rightly said but then how do we make that one voice which may or may not uh, turn the whole matter around be heard by using technology which has made it difficult to hear in the first place it's again as i said it's a two edged sword there is context in which uh you know earlier for example 20 or 30 years ago uh you the only way for you to if you were a non media professional the only way for you to engage with news was the letter to the editor uh which presumed a that you knew how to write a letter uh b that you uh, you know you had english language literacy uh, for your letter for you to write the letter uh, and c that you have the had the avenues of posting that letter and and then the editor had the final authority as to whether that letter was published or not right i'm not yes. sure if that was the if that that's a that's a fair system either right like where current existing power structures in that sense reinforce voices uh what the internet has done is it has empowered uh, a whole host of voices uh challenging current media structures uh and it is in the context of those voices that a lot of like really great independent journalism has flourished uh 
a lot of great like independent journalists are doing some really really wonderful work uh i'll say this for uh the indian context and i'll say this for like uh the global context too right uh and i really again like the cause the the landscape is constantly evolving and it's constantly sort of changing it is really incumbent on us to define what this landscape looks like for us it's really incumbent on us in our own personal capacity to find these voices that are speaking truth to power in whatever context and amplify them uh it is incumbent on us to make sure that what we are putting out on on the internet is well researched is uh uh is uh yeah is is has taken into account all sort of all sorts of perspectives and and so on uh so there is really just uh, uh it's as i said it's an ongoing question with no no easy answers and uh what we have in that sense is a constantly evolving strategy that we need to uh, arrive upon for our own selves uh to 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 truly understand and uh, assess what our own landscape is Uh, yeah rahil i have a related question i have a related question uh you spoke about empowering people's voices you spoke about democratizing media uh you spoke about encouraging independent journalism uh what about the eco chambers and you know social media cocoons we have built i mean you know as i said like it's a it's a part of our landscape it's it's a it's not a it's not an either or it's it's a whole and really the challenge is to how to how to navigate what we have uh in 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 context of the tools that we have obviously there are you know there are echo chambers but as i said earlier that you know i'm not sure if the older system was not echo chamber oriented uh so what we have then is a diff, you know a different form of an echo chamber maybe like a slightly or multiple echo chambers and it's really i mean i like there are no easy answers to this to, to this question uh jaron lanier in his book has described how social media is used to drive a systemic systematic cognitive change in a person while selling a personal information to various organizations for their gains including search history payment info how can a journalist knowing that information is there and as you said it has how do you think journalists won't be biased when the risk i don't understand this question quite honestly uh my question is rumors on social media spread like fire shouldn't there be a criteria through which rumors fake news could be verified uh before sharing um yeah of course there has to be there should be a, a criteria uh and a lot of uh, if you've seen if you've been following the space uh the news landscape in the last 2 to 2 and a half years you would have seen that there's a whole host of uh you know things that are now sort of uh put into place like uh if you saw the US election last year there was uh the manipulated media tag uh is is one of the things that has come up or uh an interstitial there off so there is a uh there are efforts being made to uh particularly in context of uh in context of big stories uh there are you know there are uh, networks of fact checkers being put into place and if you if a fact checker disputes a claim then uh google for example in their results search results will say that this is a this is a claim that's been disputed by this fact checker so there are ways of uh, there are there are like various experiments being done i don't think anything has been anything been clue or like a, i don't think there's a silver bullet answer to this uh but i think technology companies are doing uh, what they can often times not you know not enough but uh uh the elections have in that sense provided an expedited moment for technology companies to look into this uh pretty seriously uh monis can you rephrase your question it was a bit long sir uh, my question was john alin in his book has said and that social media is used to make a cognitive cognitive change in a person's mind in a people in a person's mindset change his perspective the way social media or the organization wants to me my question to you is knowing that social media has all of your info 
your payment info, your location, everything that you do, your search history, everything that is there on social media and the social media organizations, including Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, have it. For example, if I use uh, Amazon, uh, I was searching for a computer peripheral um, a week back and I still get promos of the same thing that I've been searching, but from different brands on every social media platform. My question to you is when you know that social media has access to everything, your personal data, your contacts, your payment info, your location, everything. How does a journalist make sure that knowing entire his entirety is out there? How can he not be biased when the risk is high? Because anyone can reach him at in any way. Uh, I'll uh, say if a journalist upsets, upsets a system or an organization, this information can be used to trace him and it can be harmful for him in many ways. We saw what happened to Jamal Khashoggi, right? And that is what my question is. Why social media? Why do people still go for social media? Well, again, as I said, like it's a, uh, it's, it's just the default at this point in time. And with journalists, it's, it's all the more incumbent to understand what data they are sharing with what uh, social media company. Uh, and I made that point like early on in the context of uh, our, our privacy, right? Like uh, in, in the context of journalism, it's all the more important that you are using tools that you know are end-to-end -end encrypted, that you are using platforms that you know are secure that you're communicating with uh, using platforms that you know are secure. Uh, and there is a, thankfully, there is a whole host of platforms that you can both like from the point of email, from the point of uh, view of chat uh, and so on that you can use. Uh, I would like highly encourage you to uh, look into those. And uh, as far as the, the next question, uh, the, the other aspect of your question as to uh, knowing that this exists and that they can come after you again, uh, unfortunately, uh, Journalism, as it stands today, is is under uh, attack, under siege. Uh, it shouldn't be, but it is, and uh, it is. That's that's something that journalists, including friends of mine, live with live with on a daily basis. Uh, and 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 I really do hope that uh, you know there are better tools, both like from a tech point of view and otherwise to to to, to navigate what is an incredibly complex landscape. It's not the perfect answer for this question, but uh, I feel like this is the best I can do at this point. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, Rahil, can you share some interesting anecdotes from your Twitter stint? Uh, it's time for some candid confessions. Uh, I don't know where to start. It was an incredibly exciting four and a half, four and a half years. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and uh, you know, by just by virtue of the fact that like I, you know, I was a part of a country team. Like I was one of the first people to be hired. Uh, we got into a lot of, uh, there was a lot of like really exciting stuff that happened. Uh, I remember uh, I started, I reached out to ISRO, the space agency. Uh, so sometime in, I think 2015 or so, uh, before the, before the, you know, Mars Orbiter was still in orbit. It was on its way to Mars. So I was like, listen guys, why don't we do something around this? So I worked with them over the course of like three, three and a half months. And it was, you know, it was uh, not easy uh, because it's a, you know, it's a science and space driven organization. They don't really a, care about social media or understand it. Uh, but I found a couple of like folks, uh, once we had been okayed by the chairman, I found a couple of folks within the organization that were very open to ideas. And uh, we decided to, uh, you know, onboard or start a handle for the Mars Orbiter. Uh, and the idea was that there was a 12 minute window when uh, the orbiter would enter the Martian orbit, uh, where it was basically, uh, there were no trackers that would work because it was going through the Martian atmos atmosphere and everything was blank. And on the other end, if it, you know, emerged unscathed and transmitted signal, uh, that would mean that this was a success. That would also mean that like the three and a half, four months of work that I put in, put in with the team was a success. Uh, so, and we convinced them to announce the entry into the Martian orbit using a tweet. 
uh, and they did that. Parallelly, I worked with my colleagues in the US who worked with NASA because they already had a uh, you know, Mars rover on Mars. Uh, and we bought the Mars rover to welcome the Mars orbiter. So it seemed like it was an interstellar conversation. That was a, that was a lot of fun to coordinate uh, and, and then see it like play out. Uh, because the Mars Orbiter tweeted, announced <coughs> the tweet that it had entered the Martian orbit, then it was, you know, uh, welcomed by the Mars rover and like everywhere, globally, it was like a big, big, big headline that these two entities in, in the Martian orbit, one in the Martian orbit, or the other one on the Martian surface are talking to each other. When it was basically social media teams managing this, this whole thing behind the scenes. So that was a, that was a, that was a fun uh, experiment. To, uh, uh, and since then, Twitter has become a really good news breaking tool. This one was yeah. staged, though. <laughs> this one was staged, yeah, yeah true. <laughs> Interesting as it was, but it was not a candid confession. That, uh, it's pretty candid. They wanted <laughs> not a confession. This is going live on. So I'm going to take my own advice here because this is live okay, on YouTube. Yes, sir, right, yeah. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be what we preach, yes. So, uh, yeah. Rahil, if we, if we look at the IT media rules of uh, 2021, uh, lately Twitter has been removed as an intermediary, I think just a couple of days before in India. Uh, should we view these rules, uh, you know, in a positive way because, they, uh, you know, they are something which put on us on the social media? Because, you know, till yesterday, uh, the social media companies would put the buck in my, you know, side and say that it's your job to uh, look after your privacy because, and there are certain section of people who don't know what you know privacy settings could be. You know, would it be beneficial or not? So does it does it put uh, onus on the company, social media companies, that yes, you are the one uh, who have to take care of the data because at this, as they say, data is the new oil. And uh, and in, I mean, should it be uh, from a positive point of view, or it's something which is uh, just to curb the uh, their freedom? Look, I have a very, uh, I've spoken about this uh, on multiple fora, including on national TV. Our IT laws are really bad. Uh, the previous ones that the Congress government, UPA government put into place were bad. Uh, and the ones that have been modified using that, the earlier ones by the India government are bad. They only take into account uh, how governments can control platforms. At the core of these, uh, at the core of, why these laws have been you know, amended, why the laws were formed and then amended by both governments is uh, platform control and not uh, user privacy. So no one is speaking for you and I. Uh, governments world over want to control social media platforms. That's the instinct with which they make these laws. Uh, unfortunately, if user interests were to be kept in, uh, kept in, kept in mind, these laws would look really, really differently. They would look very different. They'd feel very different, uh, but that's not that's not the case. So the current issues in context to Twitter and IT laws are, and I hope that you know, and there's a, there's a lot of obviously noise. First of all, uh, no government can. Uh, uh, it's not a, like you know, the uh, the intermediary tag, so to speak, is not like a registered trademark tag, so to speak, that can be assigned or taken away by a government. It is for the court to decide. So if uh, as a platform, I get a notice for takedown of particular content and I comply with that notice, then it's all well and good, right? But if I don't comply, then a court gets to de determine. The cops can say what they want to say, but the court gets to determine whether I'm liable or not. And as far as the case of like Twitter is concerned, it's going to be, I, I really do hope they, uh, they, uh, they mount a legal challenge uh, to what are fundamentally like really bad laws, uh, because that would be in the interest of uh, users. And, you know, WhatsApp has again taken the government of India's new rules to court. And I do hope that there are, there are the judgments will, will stand up for the user's rights because the rules as they stand ask for breach of encryption uh, which would mean that these platforms have to re-architect their infrastructure to allow a backdoor uh, into these platforms. Now think about it this way. Uh, would you live in an apartment complex 
where one of the keys for your for your house uh, stays with your local police station and they can come and go as they please without notifying you you wouldn't right so if these protections exist in the real world where your house can't be searched without a warrant from the magistrate the same protections need to apply to our speech online right what i'm saying if a government needs to investigate what i have said there needs to be a legal grounds for that it can't be that they have access to everything and then they can pick and choose what they want to come to me uh, for or what they want to come after me for so i think it's really incumbent on all of us to inform uh, and educate ourselves about these rules and uh, how bad they are uh, and strengthen voices that are that are you know talking against these rules and uh, sort of uh, ironically uh, these developments come uh, you know uh, i think just after the g7 proclamation about freedom of expression and all uh, sorry raj sir you were saying something this is one relevant question you know have the lines blurred between uh, between the technology technological aspect of it and the social aspect of it because uh, most of the companies what they are doing right now is they are moving away the 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 tech persons who should be governing these things they you know it's not something that uh, you know it's 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 not good to put somebody you know they, you know uh, who is not from the tech background but have the lines actually blurred and uh, there's no cat- clear categorization that you know who calls the shots and uh, you know if something is it an end to end you know encryption is it actually uh, being implemented in the device or in the technology or not so there is a i mean if you a very very you know casual reading even of the new amendments will tell you that these are these are they have been written by people who don't understand technology mm-hmm. and literally every single order that comes out of uh, uh, miety Uh, asking platforms to take down take down content is written by bureaucrats who really don't understand the implications of those orders uh, which is why again as i said like a criticism of these it rules in that that they only seek to establish uh, and strengthen existing power structures existing control over social media platforms they don't have the uh, they don't have the benefits of users at their core mm-hmm. they have the benefits of governments at their core mm-hmm. and that's really the core core problem uh i have uh, another 10 minutes so uh any other questions there is a question i highly recommend Chat. a book based on social yeah. media There's some some kind um, of um that's a really broad question quite honestly uh i like nothing comes to my mind per se Uh, I can send a recommendation your way uh, later. Maybe like a list. You could put. Uh, any, you could put in your email. Uh, yeah, I can share. Any journal book for reading. No, that's what I'm saying. What I can do is I can share uh, a couple of books with you guys later, and you can pass them on to the students. Or you could share your emails so that if the students have any questions, tech-related questions, sure. obviously, they could ask. I think Ali wanted to say something. Ali, are you there? uh yes sir i just have uh, two more i kept quiet for a while because other people should also have an opportunity i just have uh, two more questions and you can answer them as you please uh my first question was we talk a lot about privacy on the internet and how it's important for us to maintain our privacy and uh, companies like apple have made it a point to market their ad campaigns around privacy now given the loose privacy uh, image of google and facebook and everything else uh my question was that as a layman who has very little knowledge about technology or what privacy in the technical sphere really even means how do we equip the lay person to protect their privacy using technology and my uh, second question is due to technology nowadays teenagers not even teenagers younger kids who are 5 6 7 8 have become really famous uh due to technology uh, they have their own youtube channels uh, they have their own uh blog uh, they are bloggers and they are reviewers and uh, if you ask kids nowadays what you want to be when you grow up youtuber and a uh, blogger and internet sensation is the first answer that they'll come up with looking at the money aspect of that 
so the second question i have is how do you protect children and make them understand the importance of technology as you said time moves very differently now and uh, there is an uh, there is a uh, what you call rapid cognitive learning that happens with children nowadays because they have been uh, forced to use technology more than we as kids used to do so how do you make them understand the negative aspects of it and how do you handle kids who want to have such a profession in their life and how can you equip them to deal with such uh, the consequences of having fame uh, again like both questions good questions no easy answers to either uh, in the context of the first one i think again unless there is concerted efforts on on part of all of us to educate our own ecosystem say for example our parents and our siblings and others first of all like you know we there is a certain amount of privilege that is accrued to us on account of us being students of media so uh, and being able to understand what these conversations are right like so uh, first we educate ourselves and then we educate people around us that's really how it how it starts uh, in the context of you know uh, they being like systemic institutional the absence of systemic and institutional conversations around privacy uh, that's quite honestly at this point in time the only only way forward in context to your second question uh, again that's you know we touched upon this earlier in in context of there being a need basically to uh, at the at the primary school middle school level itself about uh, an analysis of what the internet stands for and what it what it can do to uh, do to young children uh both positively and negatively and and that really needs to you know i like i don't really from a policy point of view i don't know where a good starting point for that conversation is but that needs to be a part of uh, uh the pedagogy that needs to be a part of like curriculum itself uh as i said i don't i'm not sure like what a good starting oh, point for that conversation is but yeah Thank you. Should we take the last question? Was... Rahil, if you can, you know, add anything you like. I mean, maybe you have missed out uh, something in your talk. Maybe you you would like to, you know, recall and say something. About... Uh, no, I, look, I think again from I wanted to structure this. uh informally so that you know there is this this free willing communication and i think that's happened i i i reinforce my points from a from the point of view of uh folks who are on this on this call and who are on the cusp of their careers that uh it can it can you know adoption of technology in that sense can a thoughtful adoption of technology can be truly transformative for your careers you can uh you can really really open up open like doors for yourself that weren't available to us uh and it's also incumbent on you to understand what the implications of of using technology for journalism uh are but there is this you know there's always this undercurrent of wanting to go back to the good old times you know uh every now and then like i'll see on twitter for example uh someone will share a photo particularly in the context of you know television news being uh in some circles television news being the circus that it is now someone will share a photo of like you know news readers from the 70s or 80s saying oh wouldn't it be wonderful to go back to this time uh and to that i say no because that was really just like at that point in time it was the only avenue of news was state propaganda so while it was stayed and steady and didn't incite you to you know take sides on a daily basis but it was only like a singular perspective uh one thing that i would strongly recommend i'm going to share the link here that i truly truly want everyone to read is uh or c actually is this tech talk uh and again i have my own thoughts about tech talks but that's later but this is a good one and it talks about the danger of a single story which i think in the context of uh 
you know, and, and that principle I think applies uh, both in our personal lives as well as our professional lives. That uh, personally, like, you know, like I hope, and I say this for myself as well, that uh, in, our, in our interactions with our friends, with our family, uh, with our loved ones, we, uh, we take into account the, the multitude that is being a human being in, in today's day and age. Uh, and professionally for you guys, I think it's all the more important as journalists and those of you who want to be in journalism to recognize that uh, everything that comes your way, uh, that you're covering it from multiple perspectives, that you can get as close to the truth as possible, uh, that you are, you are speaking for those who cannot speak, speak for themselves, but you're doing it in a way that's respectful, that's not taking away spotlight from them or space from them. Uh, journalism, again, in, in that sense, is an incredibly, incredibly powerful profession. It is one of those things that that lets you, you know, form narrative, that lets you set discourse, that lets you, you're in that sense, you know, constantly recording history. So think of like what your words, what your actions will mean like 100 years, 200 years from now, which is also why it's an incredibly contested landscape, because everyone wants to control narrative, everyone wants to control history, everyone wants to, go to control perception. So you guys in that sense are, you gatekeep it. And that gatekeeping keeping comes at a huge, huge cost. It comes to oftentimes like huge personal risk and cost to your own selves, but it's a service. And as is the case with anyone who chooses to deliver a service, the costs are to be paid. And that's true for <clears throat> frontline warriors who have chosen to, you know, doctors and everyone else who chose to, over the course of the last year, year and a half, go into hospitals on a daily basis, exposing themselves to risk. That's the cost they pay for delivering that service. And there are costs to be paid, unfortunately, for being a journalist in the context that you guys do journalism is in. Uh, I really hope that those co costs, as you step into your careers, aren't very high on you and that you, you're you truly able to enjoy this for, for what it is, which is an incredible, incredible profession that... Uh, that can that can lead to like really transformative change. Some of my you know most amazing memories are from or from when when as journalist when I broke stories that impacted people. Like I remember this one story I did early in my career that led to this this guy being released from jail. So that too you know that's my career highlight. I did stories that resulted in like you know infrastructure being built. Those stories are are what I remember. And that's a, it's, it's a very, very big power, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility. And unfortunately, as I said, a lot of consequences. And it's always a balance uh, between figuring out what, what that is, like where you stand in that context. Another thing I want to, I want to tell you guys is uh, think of your careers as, as a marathon and not a sprint. So you have to, it's a constant thing. You can't sort of like tire yourself out in the next stretch. You have to like keep hydrating yourself in exactly how you would run a marathon. You have to like pace yourself, hydrate yourself, and you have to determine your own pace. Uh, and that's really the only thing, only thing that works. There are avenues available to you, opportunities available for you to switch careers when you want to switch them. And that's also absolutely fine, like whatever makes you happy. Uh, but make sure that you are, you know, you're not risk averse, that you are balancing these things in context to your own well-being and the well-being of your community. And I think that's where I'll stop. Are oh, you on mute, ma'am? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Rai. And Thanks, I was really hoping you would talk about what you're working on right now. Lamina, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. it's a streaming infrastructure platform. It basically allows a content company to go from just being a content company to spinning up their own OTT service, like a Netflix style OTT service. So the current landscape as things stand is that if you're a content company with streamable, copy protected, you know, uh, content, for you to go from having a library of that content. So for example, a movie studio has uh, 200 or 400 films and wants to do do their own Netflix style service. Uh, the journey from going to just being a content company to a, to an OTT platform means that they have to acquire engineering muscle, which is a it's a really hard problem to solve. So what we've done is we've basically created a, an end-to-end -end platform. 
So content companies in that sense don't have to pivot to being engineering companies. They can just keep doing content while we take care of everything else that 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 it involves uh, in you know streaming content. So that's basically what I'm doing. What does it mean, laminar? Laminar is a physics term. It just means steady flow. Oh, okay. Okay, that's how you named it, laminar. Thank you so much for your time. It was Thanks. really enlightening to talk to you. We had. I enjoyed it actually, you know, it didn't seem really? like it was, yeah, it didn't seem like academic in nature at all. Ma'am, would you like to say something before we wind up? I think you're muted. Abina, I think we are, you've already said like it's been so uh, interesting. Uh, in fact, I was, uh, you know, always looking at my watch, I thought we've started at six o'clock, it's almost, it'll be eight now. So, yes. but didn't seem like, and it's so interesting and it's like, you know, the like he's a journalist, so he has a uh, way of narrating gap, his, gift uh, of the gap academic yes. discourse also. So it's a pleasure listening to him. Please continue, Abina. Thank you so much. I have so many people to thank. First, I'll thank Rahil for his time and the effort and trying really to educate our students, which is our social responsibility, as we talked about earlier. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, the IQAC team of uh, Women's College. Everyone who put an effort in this webinar, all the tech support, thank you all. Thank you so much. It was really nice having you with us. Thanks and so with that, I think we should find out. Thank you for and uh, talking to the students yeah. and talking to the faculty. Really appreciate this. Thank and you. hopefully we can thank do this so offline much. at some point. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do this again. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.